Hello everybody, it's Jade. This week we're covering chapters 15.2 through 15.x in Pact. So before we get started, I do want to remind everybody that there are only three episodes left in this series, um, not including this week, but including the final episode, during which time I will be answering any questions that anybody puts in. So if you have any questions that you'd like me to address in the final episode of the show, you should start thinking of them or submitting them right about now. So, and with that, on to 15.2. So 15.2 starts out with the Knights of the Basement getting targeted by a bunch of others, which at this point I wasn't sure whether the Knights were even here, but they are, and I felt really bad because I hoped they weren't here so that they would live and stop getting killed off like Teddy. It turns out that they all make it this time, but having them here really amps up the anxiety because they don't deserve to die. Like, there's not many interpretations of this book in which you can really think that the, the knights deserve to go. So uh, it's pretty anxiety inducing, especially because at the end of this section, they are still in the middle of the shit. They're all alive at the end of 15.x, but, um, We'll see how long that lasts. But the creature that they're attacked by is this ink creature that uses its ink blood to attack people and lacerate their skin or, or burn ink into their skin. And it fits with the theme that we've seen so far in the library, which is books, paper, words. But it also goes to show that the abyss has already been prepared for Hillsglade House to fall in. Maybe it hasn't been specifically setting aside these creatures for the day that Hillsglade House falls into the abyss, but the moment it falls in, the abyss is ready and sending over as many monsters as could reasonably fit inside. It really sells the abyss as ruthless and methodical. Also in this fight, Blake says that he misses his tattoos, which on my first read, I was hoping that this was hinting towards some reconciliation with Alexis. Secondly, though, I think it's hilarious how in, in this first bit of 15-2, Blake is skating around on the floor because his wooden feet offer no traction against the hardwood floor. So then we start fighting the paper girl, which I also thought was hinting towards some reconciliation with Alexis because the paper girl is the one that, you know, tried to bleed her to death and stuff, but... Anyway, during this fight, Blake uses some wood from bookshelves that are around to patch himself up and reinforce his body, which, of course he would do this, but also, of all the things, that Blake could use to reinforce himself. I never anticipated that it would be Hillsglade House at some point. And this is his last patch up. Assuming he doesn't get another tree body in arc 16. The last thing that Blake ever reinforces his body with is parts of Hillsglade House, which is just neat. So Blake sees this book called The Killing of Angels sitting on a shelf. And now you remember that the last chapter of the last section that I read ended with Rose saying, nobody look at the damn books or whatever the line was. Um, in my defense, it had been a couple of days since I finished 15.1 and started 15.2. And I feel the need to defend myself because what happened was I was yelling at Blake for not taking this book called The Killing of Angels. I was, I was like, Blake, you're going to have to fight face all. Why don't you take this? So one of my favorite parts in this section is when Blake says... My instructions had been vague, short, nonsensical, but Evan and I were on the same page, so to speak. We are in a house that used to be a library that got turned into this demonic library fighting a paper girl. 
And Evan and I were on the same page. So Blake actually sort of forgives the paper girl and lets her go. She swears to never harm another soul. And I was honestly really surprised. Like, I thought we were long past mercy and trying to do good things and all that stuff. But, but we're not. And, and I was just really glad to see that Blake is trying to do this stuff this late in the game. And especially in the middle of the abyss. Because from this point on, he doesn't slip any further. He slips in other directions, but he doesn't slip into worse morality. I know that I said at the beginning of this book that I was really hoping that this didn't turn into a slippery slope for Blake, and it kind of did. For a while it was a really, really slippery slope. But Blake was never a person that I couldn't root for what he was doing for more than a little while at a time. I'm glad that this is the route that Pact took. So Blake looks down the... I'm presuming that this is some kind of inverted column, that they're kind of running up a spiral staircase or something. But Blake looks down to the bottom and he sees that the barber is all the way at the bottom and killing things by tearing them apart into halves, you know, that thing that we now know that he can do. And at one point, he takes this black feathered other and tears it into like a bunch of kind of human but mostly not human guts and then this like feathery bird creature and later on we see the inside of blake and rose's soul or whatever and we see that what rose's female form was made of was a bunch of ideas that the original ross had about femininity. And for these others that have been down here in the abyss for however many hundred years or whatever, and have allowed their mental faculties to be ground into tomato paste, they probably don't have much concept of what the opposite gender is like, or any kind of, you know, nuanced constructs like that. And for this, we have the bird part and the not bird part. I almost said that I hope we get to see more of these, the barber tearing things in half so that we can get more examples, but I don't really want to see that. There's a point when one of the knights accidentally shoots Blake in the chest, which is foreshadowing the fact that Blake's heart doesn't do anything anymore, which we find out in 15.4. We see Rose and Alistair being like a battle couple and just back-to-back -back fighting and they've got sweat running down their faces and stuff. What a hell of a first date, right? One of the things we see here is Ellie actually doing a really good job with combat. She's just not very careful about her own safety, so she's able to kind of kick creatures, but she'll eventually get dragged down with them, or somebody could sneak up on her and she wouldn't really know. Um, so she is fairly useful. She's just not as skilled a fighter as some of the others, but I think she did good. Blake rescuing Ellie, who falls off, and carrying her back up is a metaphor for Blake carrying the team. Okay, so then we get to the lies Rose has told you. And at this point, I realized that I was the moron. I was the moron who didn't think that we were not supposed to be reading the books. I wrote in my notes, I learned nothing from the Big Bad Kathy incident. Rose specifically told me last chapter that the books are not to be read several times. Good job, Jade. Evan points out the fact that Blake has fought two creatures that are heavily revolved around fire recently, and that there is a third beat coming up. So that's coming at some point. Second of all, we still haven't seen Evan catch on fire yet, and there's not very much book left 
I definitely don't think we're going to get out of this without seeing Evan catch on fire, so. So at one point, Ellie and Evan get into a dispute where Ellie says, what are you talking about? Kathy just got magicked or something and we're so supremely fucked and you're seriously thinking that this could turn out okay? You're not, Evan shot back. How can you get through something like this if you don't believe you can? So this reminds me of what was happening in the fan base at the end of Ward and at the halfway mark of Pact. And in the last, I promise I will not spoil anything about the ending of Ward, but in the last several arcs, every single comment I saw was people expecting that the ending had to be tragic because everything that had happened up to that, that point had been so awful and bloody and Wildbow-like. And people weren't really considering the idea that things could work out okay. And then at the halfway mark in Pact, when Blake falls down into the abyss, everybody in the comments from the original run of Pact were not only assuming that Rose would be the new protagonist, but yelling about how they didn't like Rose and didn't want her to be the new protagonist. But the thing is, why would you read something if you know for a fact that at the end everything is going to be super sad and depressing? I'm not saying that the ending of Pact is necessarily not going to be depressing, but the idea that the tragedy is set in stone kills the interest that a person could have in reading the ending. So think about selling reading Pact to somebody. Normally, you would say, this book is remarkable because of the sheer depth of shit that the protagonist has to wade through just to survive. But if you continued that with, and then at the end, he dies because no one could survive that, they're not going to read it. And extending off of this, we get this section. The high priest nodded. He sounded so weary, but he was one of the oldest people here, not counting the two remaining Behames who weren't named Alistair. He sounded so calm as he asked, he's earned the right to be optimistic, hmm? I hate this. I mean, I like Jeremy, don't get me wrong. But I hate this idea that has become so pervasive in our society, and I know, I try to avoid talking about society and stuff, but there's this thing that I see all the time that you have to be a cynic unless you've earned the right to be optimistic. And this is, of course, an idea perpetuated only by cynics. And it's annoying. Why would you want everybody else to be miserable? Because misery loves company. Jeremy is a sad man. And he has some really cool powers that we're going to see later, but in general, his life has not been a happy one. That doesn't mean that he has to stomp down on Evan's optimism, or, for that matter, the chances of the rest of the party having any kind of optimism about getting out. Speaking of which, the perseverance, tenacity, all that stuff about Evan has been this beat that we've hit like a million times throughout the book. And, and it's shown to be something that is one of the most strongly positive aspects of any character. Evan's optimism is almost never punished by the story. So I want to know how this is going to tie into Granny Rose's sacrifice the rest of the Thorburns plan. Um, not even sacrifice the rest of the Thorburns, but she wants them to all stop having female children and basically give up on the rest of the line. That's giving up. And while from a purely logical standpoint, I could totally understand how Granny Rose would want all of the grandkids to stop having female children and all the grandkids would go, yeah, okay, that sounds reasonable. But I don't think it fits thematically with what we've seen from Evan, which is that giving up is never an option and rolling over and allowing bad things to happen to you just because things look bad is not a good idea. There's this one point where it says, schmoes? Alistair asked one of the schmoes. Blake just has to throw that little needle into the, the narration. It could have just said schmoes? Alistair asked because you know that Alistair knows that he's being referred to there. But Blake just has to think to himself, yeah, that's right, Alistair's a schmo.
in the same scene, Ellie talks about all the people that have died so far. And Johannes says that the abyss is liable to grind us up and digest us. Which is, which is basically him saying that they need something that will prevent the abyss from grinding them up and digesting, digesting them. Which is Evan's optimism. But they are largely refusing it. I'm just gonna shove these all in here. Here we see Alistair grab Kristoff and just kind of shove his face into his armpit. Kristoff's like 13. Um, and then later he sacrifices his arm to save Jeremy. Alistair is a schmo. He's also a very smug schmo, but he's still a good person. And I like him. So in 15.3, the group reaches the roof of the library, the top level where the barber is waiting for them. And we get this description of the party as pieces on a chessboard. It says, We had behames in the rook positions, my friends, Johannes and the high priest as the knights and bishops, admittedly odd-numbered, and Alistair and Rose as the king and queen. The knights and my cousins weren't on the board, but instead lurked at the edges along the rear and on the side of it, guarding or otherwise watching the stairs. I love chess symbolism. And the thing is, I hate chess. My brother was on the chess team growing up, so I never wanted to play chess because I would always lose. But I love it when we go through the cast and we go, this person is the queen and this person is the rook, or whatever. Like, I watched Full Metal Alchemist like 10 years ago, and one of the scenes that I remember most clearly is the point when they're like assigning chess pieces to each character for, for no reason other than to be dramatically stylish. And, and it was super cool. I still remember what each of the characters' chess pieces would be. I think it's the assignment of people to roles. It's the, it's the same feeling you get from assigning people tarot cards to represent their, their role in the story. It's comparing things to other things. It's, it's why we like to talk about stuff in relation to other stuff. Like, like how we always get a kick out of comparing packed to worm or whatever. For a minute, I got a little bit confused as to the Rose and Alistair being the king and queen thing, because the barber wants Rose because she is the Thorburn heir. But in this game, everybody has to work together to protect Alistair, and Alistair is pretty much a sitting duck. So yeah, that would make Alistair the king, yes. So then we get to the goddamn worm. I am absolutely certain that this is the one creature that I heard the most about before I got to it. Like, there has been stuff that I heard about packed by accident or because I clicked the link to the wrong chapter or something like that. But not knowing about this one human centipede has been basically impossible. Um, people hint at it when they're talking to me about Pact and stuff like, oh, I can't wait until you get to the part with the centipede and the abyss. I'm like, dude, I'm reading. People are so excited about this thing and, and for good reason. We got zero paragraphs of description about what the marriage between Jeremy and Sandra is was like between the loss of their child and the present day. But we get like four paragraphs of description of what this thing looks like and how one guy's leg is shoved into the next guy's asshole or whatever. And it's gross. It just tells us that the thing that Wildbow really enjoys when he's writing these books it's not the character relationships or the intricate plots. It's these gross ass monsters. So we get to this one bit where Blake says, Any time he disappeared from view, I had to wonder. Had someone looked? Had one member of our group made that split second decision and looked directly at the barber, trying to see if we'd won? If the way was open? Blake has spent so much time carrying the team that he has completely lost all faith in his teammates. Not that it's unfair, but it is at least a little bit unfair. Ty is super useful here, coming up with the silence runes. Like, 
I'm reading Pale right now, and and at the point at the beginning of Pale, there's a lot of discussion of like silence runes and stuff. So I should have been thinking about this because it's fresher in my mind. But Ty is just on the ball. Okay, we need silence runes for everybody. Let's pass them around. Okay, pass you pass this rune over. At one point, Blake says, "Time magic, not true time magic, but a trick of perception." Okay, everybody at this point in Pact, knows for damn sure that chronomancy is just a trick of perception. There is no narrative reason for us to be reminded of the fact that chronomancy isn't real. Blake just wants to remind us that chronomancy isn't real because he doesn't like Alistair. Or the rest of the Bahames. So Alexis strikes Blake with lightning, which is dramatic as fuck. It's also a time that Alexis, no bullshit, just saves Blake's life. And at this point I was thinking that he really needs to get over this stupid grudge. And he doesn't have a lot of time left to do it. But finally, it says here, I realized what the words had probably been just as the lightning struck, referring to the fact that she it was mouthing something to him as she was doing the lightning strike. And this is our second beat of Alexis mouthing something to Blake that he doesn't know, that he knows what it is, and we don't. There is going to be a third beat. So Blake is able to interfere with the barber's mobility by spraying blood from the human centipede all over the shears, which prevents him from being able to enter the reflection on the shears. But... I want to know how this can be used in a little bit more detail because I'm sure that the barber is going to come back up. If they are able to flood an area in complete darkness when the barber is in the shears, can they prevent him from getting out? Can they extinguish him in some way or shunt him to a nearby reflection? I don't know and I still feel like we're gonna need this. Okay, crowning moment of awesome in this whole section is certainly the bit where Jeremy calls upon Dionysus to... Dionysus? I know. Uh, to smite all of the creatures that are surrounding the group, and they all just fly off of the pillar. It is so cool. I really like the distribution of powers that each person on the team has. Ty and Tiff are able to rapid fire, send out a bunch of runes or whatever that are able to accomplish small things. And then you've got Jeremy who can do one big thing every couple of months or whatever. And then we've got Alistair who is able to be a very effective defender, but only if everybody else protects him for 10 minutes in the middle of the siege and so on. So then we get to Alexis's death. It says, I couldn't see Alexis. I had to look over the group twice to see. I had so very little blood, only in my face, and my face was damaged, with thin branches crawling across the skin there. All the same, I felt the blood run cold, practically draining out of me. The realization that Alexis was gone was paralyzing. It froze my head in place, leaving me unable to look at Tiff and Ty, because I might see their expressions. So... Alexis dies here, and we will get to the real meat and potatoes of that later, but I wanted to talk about something else first. Kind of off topic. So Pale has started recently. Pale is the other book by Welbo in the same universe as Pact. And I promise I will not spoil anything about Pale here, but one thing that has been brought up is that all of the arc titles in Pale are phrases that were used in Pact. Now, I saw this post and I only saw the title, so I didn't actually read it because I was sure there would be spoilers in it. But the title of the prologue to Pale is called Blood Run Cold. And I've been kind of keeping an eye out in Pact for this phrase. And here it is. It describes how Blake feels upon the death of Alexis. So I am going to be covering Pale as soon as I'm done with Pact, so I'm not going to get into this now. But if the prologue is named after the point in Pact where Blake loses Alexis. It's indicative of of what? I wonder if this feeling, this fear that you've lost the person most dear to you, 
and the need to not face anyone who could confirm to you that that is the truth will play into Pale at all. Not only the person most dear to you, but the person whose worldview informed yours and dictated your behavior. So Rose starts yelling at the barber to get back and pushing Conquest into her voice, but she doesn't, but she's only able to rely on Conquest here. Um, the barber can only communicate in gestures and doesn't understand speech. The only thing he's responding to is Conquest. So eventually it fails and Blake says, good try, I said, my heart heavy. Damn it all, we set our, our sights too high. She smiled sadly. And he says, we set our sights too high. Blake had two goals over the course of the book, or two overarching goals, not the individual goals like kill all the Duchamp husbands or whatever. But one of them was to leave the world a better place than he came into it. And two, fly, ride b motorcycles, everybody lives. And with the death of Alexis here, both of those dreams are dashed into oblivion. Um, we set our sights too high refers to the fact that those things can no longer be achieved. So Johannes allows himself to be possessed by the barber, and then Blake slashes him across the eyes and is able to knock him down to the bottom of the library so everybody else can get out. Johannes' last words are, do me a favor if you please, tell that angel to go fuck himself. I take back everything bad I said about Johannes. Who cares about a bunch of middle schoolers, right? Okay, no. I, I don't think his methods were perfect. But this section largely confirmed to me that what he was doing, he was doing in good faith. I accused him of being power hungry before, but Johannes was trying something and, and I think he had good intentions. So we get this point. It says, Rose gave him a hug, Alistair. It was stiff, unexpected, and weird, without any real affection. Alistair looked more surprised than anything. And then he returned it, and he was able to offer something resembling affection. So in the background of this whole section, Blake has been, like, quietly roasting the Alistair and Rose ship, just talking about how, oh, well, it's not real love because they only met five hours ago and stuff. So on the list of things that I was like, Blake, this is not the time. This would be pretty much first, but... On a reread, it shows that Rose is missing something in the romance department. And she's very aware of this later, um, but this is just kind of foreshadowing that. Alistair seems to be genuinely into Rose. Everything that he says to her is flirty or dripping with affection in some way. And she just is trying but it doesn't come naturally. In 15.4, Blake is offered this opportunity to be the gatekeeper for the Abyss and to have to fight everybody who is trying to leave the Abyss. Basically, he will be tied down and unable to move until he has to fight somebody to make them leave, which is a shit deal. But if he doesn't take it, then everybody else won't be able to leave the Abyss at all. And it sucks. And Blake is about ready to take it because, you know, it's it's either one person stays or everybody stays. It doesn't seem like much of a choice, but Evan really starts to freak out here. He says, We can pretend this isn't an option because it really isn't, or it shouldn't be. If we start talking about this like it's an option, then Blake's going to decide it is, and if it's talking, it's not something I'm good at. I can push him out of the way of dragons or demons or whatever, but I can't push him out of the way of being an idiot. That's the last time I'd let you guys talk, he talked himself into letting you kill him. And this is the point in the story where I felt the worst for Evan. There, there have been times that I felt really bad for Evan, like when Rose was treating him like shit, or, or when he was dying in Hill's Glade House, but this section here just highlights how awful it must be to eternally be a child. And, and I'm the kind of person that I enjoy being an adult more than being a kid because as a kid everybody thinks you're cute and they don't respect your opinion but Evan will never grow out of that. Evan is cute and every time he says things nobody listens to him. Evan will always be in a situation where he has the disadvantages of, of being a child 
but without the opportunities to be treated with respect that children have built into their lives, such as having other friends who are their age. Um, and that's a lot of the reason why Evan loves Blake so much, is because Blake actually listens to him occasionally, sometimes. So Alistair and Evan each start arguing for and against having Blake stay and become this guard. And Blake doesn't really say much during this segment, but the first thing that Alistair brings up is is the fact that it's it's like I said, it's either one person stays or everybody, including the one person stays. Alistair doesn't seem to see this as as a difficult decision, even though he does appear to actually feel for Blake in the situation. But what Evan is doing is largely begging the rest of the group to seek a third option. When everybody in the group is basically out of spoons, they just want to leave, they've just watched their loved ones die, and this night has been longer than... certainly longer than the long night in Game of Thrones. And nobody has any ideas. But Evan is also right that Blake is always placed into the position of having to make the sacrifice. We noted a million times in the library that Blake kept having to place himself in the way of a hit because he was the only member of the group who could take it. And a lot of this is the construction of the Abyss, but a lot of it is Blake's personality causing it. Bolstered by Evan here, Blake starts to fight back against the idea that he should have to stay. And it's a very meager fight. He just says, you're gonna have to make it worth it to me to stay. And the Abyss notably listens to this and starts adding more and more temptations for Blake from this point on. But Ty finally snaps here. Um, he effectively blames Blake for Alexis's death. Um, he says that he's the reason why he and Alexis and Tiff were there in the first place, which is, which is absolutely true. But this is Ty's I have to help mentality being turned on its head. He doesn't really know Blake. And now Blake is the problem. He's looking to solve the problem of Blake getting in the way of everybody else getting out. But what it really does here is highlight this immense distance between them. Blake may love Ty, but Ty doesn't remember the friendship that they had. And it's never really gotten in the way until now. But here it is. So when Ty mentions that Alexis is dead, th thereby actually confirming it, not that we had any doubt up to this point, but Blake was kind of avoiding thinking the phrase, Alexis is dead. Um, it says, I saw the scene from Alexis's perspective, looking over at the others, looking up at me. She screamed something, the view distorting with each word. So this is the third beat of Alexis screaming something that Blake knows what it is, and we don't. And I'm not a huge fan of this setup, honestly, because Alexis is a character that I honestly don't feel like we saw enough of or understood enough of. We have to read a lot between the lines with her, and the fact that Blake is hearing something from her but can't even put it into the narration feels strange. But eventually, the conclusion that I came to is that something in his mental block is preventing him from being able to think about what she said. And I'm going to back this up with a point that we're going to get to later. But if I'm wrong about this being from the mental block, I'm, I'm really not sure how I feel about this. I hope we get a little bit of clarification at some point, honestly. So at first, when Alexis died by falling and just basically falling to her death, I was honestly a little bit relieved. I have been pretty sure that Alexis was going to die for a while. And with all these creatures that can prevent you from being able to go to not hell and so on and so forth. I was 
concerned about the Cabal because they have been largely sheltered from this. They haven't killed anybody. They haven't done anything incredibly shady. They haven't summoned any demons. So my thought when Alexis first died from probably just being killed by one of the random others was that at least the barber didn't get her. But then we see that Blake's tie to her, either their, the bird spirit thing or just plumb the fact that she died in the abyss, has made it so that the abyss has her soul or at least some fragment of her. And it just fucking sucks. It's like, it's like Fell, right? Remember when Fell died and the shepherd took his soul? And I was like, guys, can we just go get Fell's soul back, please? Because this sucks. That's what this feels like. Alexis is up there with Fell on the, can we make sure that she can move on or something? And I feel pretty bad that they're going to leave her here, but the fact that the fact that Rose promised to be a Scourge and work for the Abyss and go back and forth between the Abyss gives me hope that eventually one day off screen she can release this echo of Alexis into... Uh, I feel like I'm being pedantic here, but I liked Alexis. So then we get this point where it says, To be filled with noise and violence and ruin yet frozen in place. Eternal restlessness only freed when it came time to guard the gate, to dash the hopes of others. A far cry from my hopes to leave the world a better place than it had been before I was a part of it. Once I realized it, I might have screamed, snapped, broken. I looked at Alexis, and rather than relief, I thought I might break in an entirely different manner. I believe this is actually the third time we equate Alexis with leaving the world a better place. And now that she's dead, the world in Blake's eyes can never improve. And it is a small wonder that he feels so helpless in this section. So Rose starts to make a deal with the Abyss for Blake's soul. And at first we're like, really? Rose Thorburn is making a deal for Blake's soul. But then she starts using sympathy to like toss knights back who are trying to escape. And you're like, oh shit, she is serious. And then she uses the hyena to, like, cut Blake's heart out. And we're like, what is this? What is going on? Actually, she doesn't use the hyena. She pulls she pulls his heart out and then she uses the hyena later. But do you remember how last week I said that we were going to reach a whole bunch of more points where I start to cry my eyes out? Yeah, this was this, was this week's, like, the point when she starts doing the fake familiar ritual thing, like, I was toast. I was mashed potatoes. I was gravy. Killed. So now that Alexis is gone, Rose kind of takes on this role of the world to Blake. In fact, it's pretty literal in that after this, he's inside her head, and when he looks around, the only thing that he sees is the landscape of the inside of her mind. It's symbolic. I've been hoping that Blake would give Rose a bird spirit, but he is the bird spirit. Rose's whole shtick is that she can think about the future, but she doesn't know what she wants about the future. And Blake, he can't really think about the future, but he does know the things that he likes and he knows himself. In this scene, Rose decides both of their futures by taking him out of the abyss, and then also promising to be a scourge. It is great. So I could be wrong here, but I think I'm right. So the previous deal between Blake and Rose was that if he did anything that could endanger her future or encroach on her life, she could cut his heart out with the hyena. Not cut his heart out, but she could stab him with the hyena, thus killing him. In this scene, his potentially becoming the guardsman is putting her future and her life at risk. And she stops this by cutting his heart out with the hyena in a much more gentle and positive way. It's a fulfillment 
of their deal. Except in the complete opposite way from what we were thinking. And I'm, I'm only 95% sure that that's what we're seeing here, but I don't think they bring the hyena with them. I think that this is the last time that Rose could actually stab Blake with the hyena. I think this is the fulfillment of their pact. Did you catch that title drop? I accept, I said. Not because I didn't have better words, but because we were out of time. Okay, Blake. We know you don't have better words. Just admit it. Blake is taken into Rose's soul or whatever, and he can see their combined existence. Um, Rose on the left and Blake on the right. And it just reminded me of that point in 9.8, Eight, the last chapter of arc nine, when Blake is drawing out the stories of each of them, and it says, this is the story of Blake and Rose. Um, I really hope we get that thing finished up. I just, I really want that diagram to be completed by the end of this. Especially because they could theoretically combine their creative powers now to create something that is reasonably readable. It says, I was only spirit now, relatively small compared to what I'd once been. From a human to a fragment of a human possessed by the abyss, now only a fragment of spirit. Okay, he's not very much left, but at least the fucking abyss is gone. He doesn't have to deal with the abyss. Yes. But you know what he does have to deal with? Conquest. So, let's talk about 15.5. And we're going to change the topic. So you remember how the Behames taught all of their kids to hate the Thorburns? You know, the kids are basically brainwashed from a young age to stay away from the Thorburns because they're terrible. You have to hate them. And remember how the Thorburns have some kind of weird incest thing in their background? So what the fuck is going on with the Behames and the Thorburns? They can't keep their hands off each other. It's so weird. So first we had Rose and Eamon, and they got into a fight in the middle of the woods, and then after like 10 minutes, they spontaneously started having sex. And then Alistair met Rose, and 15 seconds after this, he asked her to marry him. And yes, there were extenuating circumstances there, but... And then we come across... Peter and Ainsley, who have been left alone for an hour. An hour. And Rose is under the impression that Peter is just being a scumbag here and trying to get Alistair all riled up. And to an extent, I'm sure that is true. But he also seems to be seeking some genuine level of comfort and stability from Ainsley. And he also doesn't leave during the final battle when Rose specifically tells him that he can. It's weird. And I know, I know, this could totally be a coincidence, but after this they're supposed to go back to the Baham house, and now we're going to have a bunch of Thorburns and Behames all in the same house. So if, if something happens with Craig and Ellie, are we going to continue to pretend that this is all just a bunch of coincidences? Also, how is this supposed to work with Alistair and Rose now that now that Blake lives in Rose. That's concerning. So this whole setup with Blake being in Rose's head is, is really cool for a bunch of reasons. And trust me, the majority of the rest of this episode is going to be me talking about how cool this is. But one of the cool things is that Blake had his, his heart corrupted by the abyss. And we even saw when Rose pulled his heart out that it's it's useless and it does nothing. And and Rose's brain has been completely corrupted by conquest. Like it, it's just taking over more conquest is taking over more and more in her brain. So by fusing them back together, they are able to actually have a usable skill set. And it's uh, I'm so excited for for the rest of this book with with having them 
share a body and, and share skills and so on. I'm, I'm so excited. Because of the whole thing about, you know, the twin, the female twin ends up with the heart. This is, this is that conspiracy that ended up with Rose having the heart. It's, and, and the entire soul. It's so neat. Um, also, right around this time, somebody asked me, what do I think Abyss versions of some of the rest of the cast would look like? And it reminded me that for a while, and I was pretty sure this wasn't going to happen because I didn't stumble across any fan art of it, I've really wanted like a Blake equivalent of Rose as far as I wanted to imagine what a treeified version of Rose would be like. And I came to the conclusion that it would be super cool if Rose had like rose vines as her muscles and they had like thorns on them so that if she walked by something it would it would scratch and then if she had like bits of flesh that were more sensitive because they were the same consistency as flower petals or whatever. Okay, this sounds like I'm rambling, but it was really cool in my head, okay? But I also knew that we were never going to get this. So the fact that Conquest's influence manifests as these white flowers that have taken over the inside of Rose's brain was just exactly what I wanted. It's a continuation of the whole Earth Druid thing on Rose, except it's in her brain, which is neat. So this whole time I've been describing Blake and Rose's personality traits as modules, like Blake has the teamwork module and Rose has the planning module and both of them have the bossy jackass module. But I swear, I, I didn't know about this. That's just the way I talk. But the fact that they do have modules, like literal modules that can be like swapped between them, it is so cool. Is it cool for any particular reason? No. But they can swap them out. It's it's like I'm watching a, a kid's infomercial about a toy where you can swap out the body parts. So we find out that a significant chunk of Blake's social life was completely deleted so that he would have fewer ties to Toronto and less resistance to leaving to go to Jacobsville. So can we all just agree that he was in a relationship with Alexis? Like, every single interaction they've had up to this point has pointed to it. I have suspected it since... Okay, for a while, since we knew that Blake was a real boy, I was pretty sure that this was going on. But, for example, the very first thing we see about Alexis is that she asks him to have a threesome. And some people have commented that, like, isn't it weird that she asks him if he wants to have a threesome if she should know that he has this baggage that prevents him from having sex? No, she wouldn't, because if they were together, they probably were having sex on the regular. Blake already knows that the reason he the reason he doesn't want to have sex is because of Granny Rose's design. Second of all, we know that from Rose's parents thinking that she also didn't go to college, we know that the details of each of their lives are completely unclear to everybody that's not one of Blake or Rose. The, the details of what's going on have been just barely transmitted. Like in Alexis's case, it was, you're not in a relationship with this person anymore. You're a friend. And that's all she knows. Um, or that's all that she's been led to believe. This whole story with Alexis in it makes a whole lot more sense if we just assume that Rusty or Russell or Ross or whoever was dating her, or perhaps even more serious since the very beginning. And it would explain why Blake can't think about certain things that she whispers to him. If she was saying things like, your memory of our relationship was deleted, or something else to that effect, or I think I was once in love with you. He wouldn't be able to comprehend it. Like he could make out the words, but it wouldn't make it into his head. That's honestly what I think happened. I'm, 
I'm like 99.999999% sure that this is the case. But why does this matter, right? Alexis is dead. Because each of Blake and Rose has a certain set of modules, right? And one of the things that we see about Rose's affection towards Alistair is that it's extremely minimal and awkward. She says he's attractive and she can even see a future in their marriage where she doesn't want to murder him. What incredibly lukewarm praise and incredibly lukewarm enthusiasm. She thinks he's cute, but she has a difficult time expressing or even feeling affection towards him. So the point of all this is that what happens here is that Blake gives Rose his love for Ty, Tiff, and Alexis. He gives her all of the feelings that encompassed how he felt about them, so that he still remembers facts, but she can have the notion of having friends and the notion of working on a team effectively. And I want to watch from here on out whether Rose's interactions with Alistair improve. Now, I went back and reread everything that, that Rose and Alistair talk about from here on out, and there's not much to indicate either way. Uh, she does do a bit more physical contact with him, but it's kind of slight. But she doesn't have any more thoughts that she doesn't know whether she actually likes him or whatever. Um, so we'll keep an eye on it. So Alistair repeatedly expresses that he doesn't think that Rose should have taken Blake in as an additional passenger in her body. It's getting really crowded in there. But we kind of know that he's coming at it from a place of prioritizing Rose. He comes across a little bit selfish, like he doesn't place Blake first, but he is always looking for the best for Rose. And that brings me back around to this point that I, to be honest, completely forgot to make last week about face all. I put this note in my notes that my eyes just kind of skimmed over, so I want to talk about it now. So last week we saw that face all generally has the best interests of humanity at heart. Objectively, almost everything that he does is for the benefit of humanity, if not everything. Traditionally, this would make him good, an angel even, but he doesn't care. And for this reason, when he does bad things, it allows us to hand wave all of the good things that he's done because he didn't care while he was doing it. So I want you to consider an alternative version of the story. Where Faisal is a more traditional angel, where he well and truly cares about humanity and the earth, and he has realized for whatever reason that he must condemn Jacob's Bell. It breaks his heart to do it, but he doesn't tell the citizens because he wants them to have peace in their final days. Wild Bow could make me love that character, and it could be tragic. Instead, Faisal is doing the exact same thing, he just doesn't have the guilt and brokenheartedness that comes along with the first scenario that I described. And for that reason, we think he's a jackass. He doesn't have traditional human emotions. He just wants the earth to continue spinning, and we hate him for it. Is that really right? Should we really blame Face All for not having human emotions? Is that fair and just? If the only thing that separates a good person from a bad person is how much they feel when they do good and bad things, are we just thought police? And I don't know. And I anticipate talking a lot more about this in future episodes. But for now, I just want to say this book has done more to destroy my concept of good and evil than Worm could ever hope to. The funniest thing in the whole book so far, like everything else obliterated, was the point when Alistair is trying to get Peter to say something sarcastic on his behalf. And Peter is just repeatedly like, but I don't really understand what's going on. And I would totally say something sarcastic for you, but I just... I have no idea what's happening right now. It is so good. So Paige is back and Isadora warned Blake that everybody else was going to get pulled in because of him, but that she would protect Paige from Blake's influence. But now that Blake is Rose, Paige has been pulled right in. So Rose takes Lordship of Jacob's Bell jointly with Alistair and then almost immediately gives it right back up and says, 
This place is a dump. I don't want this place. <laughs> this is going to go over really, really well with Conquest. Um, I'm sure Conquest will be thrilled by the idea that Rose gave this up. No, but seriously, I feel like this is honestly something that Blake influenced her to do. This is, this is Rose relying on Blake's line of reasoning over using Conquest or over being influenced by Conquest. And it's awesome. Not that I think that Jacob's Bell should just be dumped into the abyss. I'm not 100% sure on it. But I like the fact that Rose is using somebody else's brain than Conquest's. So it occurs to me that Blake said that he was the pawn and he was not super happy with this. But something unique about the pawn is that if they last long enough and do well enough in chess, eventually they become a queen. The queen is Rose. Rose is the queen in our chess analogy. The last sentence of 15.7 is, I'm such a bitch, she thought. I privately agreed, but I wasn't sure I'd ever liked her more. In 7.x, the first time we get Rose's perspective, Rose pulls a note out of her pocket after Blake gets abstract demoned, and she reads the note, and the note says, I'm not gonna tell you what just happened because I want you to forget or whatever. And she says, I'm such a bitch. It's poetry. So 15.x. Um, so the narrator of this tried... Now let me, let me just... The narrator in this chapter, what happened to him is... He tried to summon demons to make money. What an idiot. There's this one point where it says, It's a similar pattern to members of the Choir of Unrest writing tomes themselves under the guise of being Diabolists. A hard thing to ignore when new Diabolists crop up every other month, or when we're being asked to distribute books. I thought about this for like an hour. I was like, was Black Lamb's Blood written by a demon? Was Granny Rose a demon? Were they both demons? I'm, okay, I'm, I'm currently convinced that neither of them were demons, and this was just meant to make me think about this for an hour, but still. I don't think that Black Lamb's Blood was written by a demon because the author of Black Lamb's Blood was a friend of Granny Rose's, and I don't think that Granny Rose would not be able to tell if her friend was a demon. Like, actually, come to think of it, how would they know that Granny Rose wasn't able to tell that? The only person who told them that Granny Rose and this person were friends was the chauffeur from the lawyers. The fact that the dude sold off his familiar just sold to me that this guy was a just a whiny little bitch and an asshole, like, completely irredeemable in my eyes. I know that, I know that Fisher probably did some bad stuff, he was a Diabolist familiar, but... Cold, man. Just cold. We see Granny Rose trying to get information from our POV character, the lawyer, and she's doing it kind of as a, hmm, I'm considering being one of the lawyers, like, that's an option for me. But I never got the impression that that's actually what she was doing. From what I can tell in this whole section, what she's really doing is just trying to get as much information about the lawyers as she can so that she can draft up more and more of a plan for Rose and the rest of the heirs. So we get a bunch of people back. Um, Callan, Laird, and Fell. But I wonder what the decision process here was. It says there's four people who are in all black that come back. Is it... Is it June? I don't know. I'm really excited about this though, but I also... I also wonder, like, why wasn't it, for example, Granny Rose? Or Alexis? Um... I have no idea what's about to happen with these creatures. Um... Fel apparently says no trick, um, as in it's really him, but I also don't feel like a demon would just bring your loved ones back from the dead to be nice. So, yeah, I have no idea. Anyway, this is the most hype that I've felt at the end of, a, of an arc, um, and I cried the whole time. So, yeah. Next week, starting 16.1. See you at the next one.